Good day, everyone. This is uh, Chris back again with the Ancient Scholar. This is going to be part three in a uh, series of videos on um, the National Registry Advanced Emergency Medical Technician uh, Cognitive Examination. And I'll be focusing on um, areas, uh, content, uh, content areas, and areas of knowledge that uh, you may want to study. It may help you out. Uh, it may not, but uh, uh, it, it may as well give you at least some sort of idea of what to expect. Uh, when you take the exam. As always, this is a, a spoiler-free exam, if you will, and we'll not be discussing specific questions or specific answers uh, that I came across on the exam when I took it. Okay, so let's pick right up where we left off. Normal vital signs. Uh, I would I really suggest you have a good idea of what normal vital signs, um, what are normal vital signs in patients um, among all the age groups from uh, from a newborn all the way to an adult and really some of the you know the general categories of, of uh, normal ranges and so on and so forth that will certainly help you out um, as you uh, make your way through the exam. Uh, communicating with patients you definitely have a pretty decent idea of how, how do we communicate with people you know what kinds of questions do we ask you know what, what, what about an open-ended question versus a closed-ended question uh, what about communicating with patients that um, have uh, certain disabilities? Uh, uh, they may be cognitively disabled, uh, they may be hard of hearing, um, they may be blind, um, and they may have other types of, of disabilities. So having an idea of how we would effectively communicate uh, with those kinds of patients uh, can be uh, helpful. Um, okay. Um, going back to BLS, uh, knowing when to uh, or what kinds of things you'd look at for uh, terminating uh, CPR out in the field. Um, you know, this is becoming you know a bit more prolific in the United States, at least, uh, which is a good thing. You know, being able to identify and recognize patients where you know we may want to consider uh, terminating uh, CPR efforts and what kinds of uh, things uh, would, would let us know that that perhaps a patient. Um, is is not viable. You know, this could be uh, injuries. It could be related to their illness, and there are a lot of cardinal um, f findings. You know, uh, post mortem lividity, a large open head injury with you know exposed exposed brain matter, and a patient that has been you know, down for several minutes, and and so on and so forth. Uh, so that definitely uh, could be helpful. Um, definitely you know a little bit about legal ethical implications such as you know the components of um, negligence you know how we assess those and what goes into those components um, talking about getting consent you know um, you know when when is it necessary or appropriate to do implied consent um, or um, and uh, understand uh, what informed consent is what is it when I have informed consent? What do I have to do? What do I have to explain to the patient? You know, what, what really goes into informed consent as far as explaining what we're doing and the risks and benefits of, of doing one thing versus another. Um, uh, being able to identify abnormal respiratory patterns would be very important. And not only being able to identify an abnormal respiratory pattern, but be able to um, understand what types of conditions or types of pathology can cause those abnormal respiratory patterns. For example, something I've already talked about, like uh, diabetic ketoacidosis and um, you know, the, the uh, specific type of hyperventilation uh, that can occur in patients that have uh, DKA, uh, Kussmaul's respirations, and what would that look like and what would somebody look like who presented um, with that. Now, obviously, that's just one example of, you know, potentially uh, several examples of abnormal respiratory patterns that you can run into. Um, definitely study a little bit on your anatomy and physiology. I know the major organs, know what goes on in the major organs, um, the major, uh, some of the major neurotransmitters. Oh, that's my loon clock again. Um, and kind of where some of the major transmitters and hormones are secreted, for example, you know, where does where does nor, norepinephrine and epinephrine come from? Uh, what about insulin and glucagon? We talk about the islet cells, islet of Langerhans, and um, even more specifically, there are um, alpha and beta cells and other cells, but alpha and beta cells um, within the islet cells 
and you know uh, which of these cells produce insulin, what produce glucagon. So just some, some anatomy and physiology of organs, organ systems, uh, you may find very helpful. And knowing uh, kind of key anatomical structures, for example, what happens at the carina. You know, what, what is it, you know, what's really going on at the carina where I have the right and left main stem bronchus branching off, you know, what, it, what, what does that designate, uh, you know, major airway, uh, upper airway structures, you know, the, the tongue, the uvula, the epiglottis, even though we don't necessarily innovate as advanced EMTs, uh, you want to have a good, uh, good understanding of the, the, the basic anatomy and physiology of some of the major structures, the important structures that we run into. Um, to include um, cardiac structures. Uh, for example, know the basics of a cardiac conductive system, the SA node, um, the AV node junction, uh, the right and left bundle branches, the Hesperkinji fibers, and know um, that if a cardiac cell had to take over as a pacemaker, uh, if the SA node were to fail, depending on where that cell is in the heart, um, the intrinsic rate at which it fires um, is going to be different. Um, also know a little bit about the basic anatomy of coronary arteries, and you have your right coronary artery, your left coronary artery, and you know we know that the coronary arteries receive most of their perfusion during diastole, because uh, during systole the um, the aortic valve actually flaps open and covers the right and left coronary artery, but during diastole when the uh, aortic valve closes, I have backfilling of the coronary arteries um, occurring. So just kind of um, some of the basic anatomy physiology like that can uh, be real helpful. Um, know what situations require us to call in you know, additional resources, be it a hazmat team, a confined space rescue team, um, fire, uh, and, and so on, just some basic operational issues there. Um, definitely know about the basic medications, the basic pharmacology that we run across the AMT level. Um, this includes all of the basic EMT medications and, and, and can include um, let's see, epinephrine 1 to, 10, uh, 1 to 1,000. Um, how do we give it? What do we use it for? You know, for it's an anaphyla anaphylactic reaction. Um, dextrose 50%. Um, you know, how, how do we give that? When would we give it? Um, you know, what, what are normal blood sugars? Would assist, you know, what's an abnormal blood sugar? And, you know, uh, all signs and symptoms of altered mental status associated with that when we give it. Are there major side effects of these medications? Uh, you know, know, the, know just kind of the real, the real basic uh, pharmacology of those. Uh, so we got epinephrine 1 to 1,000, dextrose 50%, um, albuterol, or salbutamol for my, uh, uh, my uh, friends overseas. Um, you know, how do we give it? Are there different ways of administering albuterol? For example, I have a small volume nebulizer I could administer, or what we call a handheld nebulizer. There's also an, a meter dose inhaler. Know how we administer medications. What, what are the optimal breathing techniques and what are the things that we need to educate our patient about as far as administering um, albuterol? Uh, some other medications, I think I talked about the, you know, the Mark I kit, uh, aspirin, uh, nitroglycerin. At this point, we will, we're no longer necessarily uh, helping a patient administer. We're actually making the decision to administer nitroglycerin. So we need to know what nitroglycerin does, base, its basic pharmacology. And you know, what is the, the basic pharmacology of nitroglycerin? Well, nitroglycerin causes vasodilation. Uh, through some pretty interesting mechanisms that uh, that you really probably aren't going to see um, at least at, at the level of this examination. They involve nitric oxide, but they can cause um, some vasodilation. And what does that do? Well, that decreases preload to the heart. That means that there's less blood getting um, loaded into the, the the particularly the left ventricle of the heart, and that means the left ventricle of the heart doesn't have to work as hard. So it de it decreases preload does decrease uh, cardiac output and decreases myocardial workload, myocardial oxygen consumption, myocardial oxygen demand, and hopefully increases myocardial oxygen supply somewhat. That's one of the major mechanisms um, that nitroglycerin works by, and obviously there are some side effects associated with that, and there are some uh, relative and absolute contraindications, such as patients that take sildenafil within you know 24 hours uh, or Viagra because um, you get some additive effects. Also, patients who are hypotensive or have right ventricular issues 
um, if they're hypotensive, hypotensive or perhaps they're extremely tachycardic, you would consider those uh, probably contraindications for the administration of a nitroglycerin, at least at the advanced EMT level. Um, uh, you may see uh, glucagon uh, may come up on there as well as a medication.